Hello, everyone, and we're back. Um, we have, well, he's not new to me, but he's new to the show. Uh, my good friend Elliot is with us today. Um, hello, Elliot. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Uh, and today we are going to be discussing a, what I think, and I think Elliot would agree, um, a really cool, uh, to use a fancy academic word, a really cool, uh, perhaps insightful, um, highly applicable to our current world um, article. Uh, academic article, it was published a while ago, um, 1955 um, by Max Gluckman um, called The Peace in the Feud. Um, so we're gonna get, all, we're gonna talk about feuds today. Uh, whether that's uh, Hatfields and McCoys or, you know, various Scottish clans knifing each other in the dark, or perhaps, I don't know, the American political system, uh, feuds, talking about feuds today. But uh, since Elliot is new, Elliot, I will let you introduce yourself to whatever level of anonymity or specificity that you'd like. So tell us oh, awesome. whatever you'd like about yourself. Thanks. Yeah, my name is uh, Elliot, and uh, you know, probably a couple of years ago, I would have had a much more clear series of labels to easily orientate myself with y'all here. I've been studying the postmodernist the last couple of weeks, and so like I'm I'm coming to this term of like meta traditionalist proactionary, uh, which is completely a, a, a douchey way to put that. But I, I don't it. know of a I don't know of a better way of, of like summing up my feelings at this particular second. I, I, I you know, uh, enjoy, I'm a Rothbard enjoyer. I'm a agorism enjoyer. Uh, you know, Vanu is another concept I enjoy, but, uh, it, you know, I, I, I describe myself as an intellectual street fighter, um, you know, uh, or a phil philosophical street fighter, a philosophical redneck, intellectual redneck, you know, redneck intellectual, that sort of thing. So I'm, uh, you know, I have uh, some academic achievements, you know, I got a BS in math, uh, but really no other academic achievements besides that. So bam, there you go. There you go. Well, I will say too, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this on any of the episodes so far, I may or may not have, but I do always say uh, to sort of to, to, to other people and sort of my broader intellectual life, intellectual sphere, you know, as my friend Elliot always says, I, I'm kind of a philosophical street fighter. And I, I really, I, so I, I have, I've taken that from you, but I always cite my sources. So uh, I hope that's okay. I cite my source because it's just such a wonderful image. Um, also, it just makes me think of street fighter, which kind of makes me happy. So um, yeah, you know, this, uh, for, for those of you who've been watching for a little bit, and thanks to our subscribers out there, we are slowly getting more of you. Um, the show has, I mean, I'm also going through, Elliot, uh, uh, as we, as, I think as any thinking person should be, and, and a, you know, a growing, you're growing, you're thinking about new things, you're discovering new thinkers, and you're reevaluating what you thought you knew, and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. th this show is, doesn't really have a strong, um, to borrow a religious term, confessional allegiance, um, except mm -hmm. that it is uh, sort of, at least for me, and most of the other people who are on here, uh, sort of rapidly anti-progressive, anti-current nice. thing, um, which again is sort of using negative descriptors um, kind of on purpose because you know what what we want to be sort of positively in the logical sense uh, is sort of like meh, whatever that whatever comes out of that but but we basically know what we don't like and I think you know most yourself included you're, you're in good company with the others who have been on the show before because we're all sort of very much um, tired and angry with the current thing capital C capital T TM uh, spawn, you know, Coca-Cola presents yeah. the current thing. We don't like that current thing. Um, Coca-Cola well, and Uniclef. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Well, and you know, um, yeah, that's basically, that's, so you're, you're, you're in good company and, you know, it, it, uh, <laughs> we, we, it. yeah. And someday we need to get you on with some other people too. We should have like a, like a Brady Bunch episode where we get like everybody, although that might be pure insanity. We'll see. It'd be nice to, to, to sort of get all the infinity stones together. We'll see. Maybe that will happen. Um, <laughs> typically, cool. typically four is the magic number. <laughs> yeah, four is the magic number. Um, yeah. Uh, so this, um, a little bit of intro, I guess, just um, to those of you um, who don't know this um, work, and I'm going to assume, not in a pretentious academic way, just in a, I'm going to assume that most people haven't read this because I hadn't read this until recently. Why did Colin read it? Colin read it because Colin's doing a whole project right now um, on 
early um, medieval feuds in, um, um, but in sort of in the Sax, between the Saxons. So the historical Germanic speaking group in what is today Northern Germany, they got in a lot of feuds and there was a lot of fighting. And so um, I'm, I'm sort of been, been reading this for a bit. Um, this article is not about the Saxons. It's not really about uh, medieval Europe at all. Um, it's really about um, the New Air people um, of sort of broadly speaking, uh, Northeastern Africa. Um, so why did I read this? I, um, I read it because it, a lot of the stuff I had was reading was referencing this article. Like multiple sources I was finding on, you know, early European feuds was referencing Grossman's article, The Peace and the Feud, The Peace and the Feud. And I was like, well, shit, I got to read this thing. And lo and behold, it's this like wonderful, relatively short, I think it's only like 20 pages, maybe less, um, summary of like feud dynamics between in this one part of Northeastern Africa. And you could claim, well, that has nothing to do with Colin White, that has nothing to do with, with myth medieval feuds. And what the fuck does that have to potentially do with, you know, American politics today? And, you know, Grossman's no longer alive. Um, but I think he would very much push back and say, well, no, uh, feud structures, we tend to think of feud structures as existing in sort of quote unquote primitive um, societies. And we tend to think, you know, sort of on this, again, this, this grand march towards progress, whatever that means, that once humans decided to get together and make organized states, feuds just went away because all of a sudden you had a king or a court or priests, you know, deciding between, uh, you know, who, who gets to keep what half of the baby, if you know that famous story, yeah? Solomon decides, you know, some king is deciding what's happening and all of a sudden feuds just vanish. Um, that sort of tends to be how feuds are, have been viewed sort of in anthropological thought, you know, really strongly in the, in the modern period. And Grossman comes here in the fifties, right? Like in the 50s and says, actually, um, maybe like feuds never went away. And maybe the feud structures in these smaller tribal societies have something to tell us about our quote unquote Western world. So um, that's just, that's kind of my brief, somewhat brief intro to the work. Um, it's unfortunately, I'll try to see if I can make it available it, 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 it's always a little dicey with that, putting stuff up. I'll try to see if I can find a place online where people can read it, if anyone's interested. But I think, you know, I've read it a few times. Elliot has read it, and it sounds like you've enjoyed it, Elliot. So we can, we can provide kind of a good overview of the argument and, and then our reaction to it. And what I think is what I would like to do in the um, discussion today as well is, if I may, and this is going to sound super pretentious and super academic, and I try to have this channel not be super pretentious, but there's something that I'm calling right now, working title, feud theory, that takes basically what Grossman's talking about here and attempts to apply it specifically to, I don't know, like the, the unraveling situation in the United States right now, where you have, I don't know, multiple factions vying for power, I don't know, in something like a feud, um, so if, if, you know, I guess you all will have to bear with me with my pretension. Um, but I, I do think you can extrapolate this article out into a broader view of how different groups of humans, um, vie for power, right. And whether that involves shooting, stabbing, killing, or whether it simply is just, I don't know, something equally violent, like voting, uh, the feud is is there and we live in the feud. Um, I don't know. I guess that's sort of, again, at, at the risk of being pretentious, that's sort of my broader teaser about what I'd like to get into today. Um, no, so to, to join you in, yeah, in, in that in that pretension, um, essentially I might I might suggest uh, again as a as a sort of uh, interlude for where my head's at, that this is again pretension, an obvious corollary to the initial writings of our dear Uncle Ted, um, if, if you yes. get all those references. And, and yes. I think like given his, uh, not to spill the beans, but given his notion of the power process that feuding is not part of the human condition in poverty, but rather it's as part of the human condition as a part of being 
a what I would call a chasing animal, right? An animal who is both predator and prey, particularly an apex predator. I don't think you get to be an apex predator and not in some ways have feud be a part of your your sort of essence, if you will. But anyhow, that's that's my pre-argument, if you will. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean I'm not I'm definitely not an animal animal behavior specialist. I'm definitely not a biologist, but even just from a total like you know, noob level understanding of like yeah, you find apex predators get in feuds as well, right? Like you watch any nature channel special and you'll see, you know, the two male lions vie for mates in the area. You're like, oh, um, right. It's 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 nice to think that humans aren't like that. We kind of tell ourselves that we don't do that. Um, we're good people. To quote Jerry Seinfeld, I am a good person. Um, but, but how good are we really? Because, uh, you know, you go to, I mean, thank God I'm partnered and I don't have to deal with this shit anymore. But you, know, you go to a bar on a Saturday night, uh, there's there's some vying for potential mates happening and you can just watch it. And, uh, you know, depending on the bar you're at, it might get kind of violent. So yeah, the apex, that's a really good point. The, the, something about being the top dog or the top ape, I guess, um, in this case. Uh, yeah, you're going to have feuds. You're going to, you're going to, you're which, going to. Which... Scrap. By the way, you brought up dogs earlier, and I think scrap is a perfect way to put that because dogs play fight, humans play fight, and particularly oh, yeah. human males, but all yeah. dogs play fight, you know, irrespective of, 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 of biological sex, they, they, they play fight. And, and so there's this notion I like to say, and I know that you're a Kierkegaardian, so you'll appreciate this. I like to say, hey, God is the ultimate and to strip the angry Old Testament God from God is to create a God-like idol and then worship that. To, 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 to reduce God to being peace-loving hippie is, is actually not to worship God at all, uh, one thing. And then the other thing, we're creating God's image. So if God can get pissed off, we can get pissed off. If God can be fractious, we can be fractious, right? And so there's this notion that people want to reject up in the heavens, this notion that violence is part of manifestation of particularity itself, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. And that is, you've, this is why I love talking to you, because that is, let's put a pin in that. We'll, we'll try to get you back <laughs> on and that, that's, that's, <laughs> yes, we will. That'll be the follow-up. Um, <laughs> I'm just yes. here to open up cans of worms. <laughs> yes. Hey, as long as it's not a can of whoop ass, because we're not in a feud right now. So remember that exactly that apes together strong and we are not, we're not fighting. Yeah. Four um, legs bad, two legs good. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Well, as a brief aside too, you brought up uh, the whole dog thing too. You know, um, there is some, this is a completely, perhaps completely off topic, but it's something that I love to point out um, as somebody who is very intellectually curious. Um, there is actually a whole um, school of anthropological thought um, that is looking at sort of the co-evolution of um, humans and um, what became domesticated dogs and looking at all the ways in which humans, um, modern humans, act a lot like canines. Um, and it's actually really fascinating. I can link to the book in the description. It would be a whole other topic for another day, but it um, dogs feud too and humans feud i don't know maybe there's something there um no i would i would yeah. you know my a hot take is i would probably classify perhaps a dog as a sort of human and a human mm -hmm. as a sort of dog sort of right dog, it's yeah. almost like we're two species within the same species if you really think about it but anyway that's all right. as a dog lover i agree 100 percent. anyhow um that yeah we should do another episode episode of that too anyhow everyone in the who's watching is like good lord just get to the point apologies <laughs> Uh, this is uh, this is your brain on ADD, kids. Um, okay, so feud. Um, Elliot, I'll just, I guess, not to put you on the spot too much, but um, I'm going to put my teacher hat on. If you just bear with me. <laughs> what did you, what, what are your gen, your initial reactions or specific reactions to this, um, to this article? Um, and, and by this, hopefully, uh, I know that not everybody can have access to read this. We can give the audience some sense of like what Grossman's art, argument really is. Um, oh, so. for sure. Yeah. yeah, my my initial reactions are like um, are are essentially thus that this this basically is wildly bias confirming for me, right? Because this sort of the, the key the sort of key takeaways. If you didn't want TLDR, this article, in my opinion, is that uh, is that a uh, human societies are are shaped in large part by their environment, 
right? Yep. Certain social situations are due to their environment, whether that's social, physical, blah, blah. The way that you navigate the universe is due in large part to your environment. Step yep. one. Step two, right? That uh, there is a, a sort of natural hierarchy amongst humans that forms in yep. sort of every scenario. And yep. that the closer you get to you, the less violent you are to the people around you. So there's this sort of notion that I've pimped before on other and other forums called the sort of uh, the sort of like abstract um, or the weak the W at nap the weak nap which is yep. to say that you you do not aggress uh, you aggress less against the people who are closer to you and more against people who are farther from you and I think that implies the nap overall okay yeah. and then uh, the last nap, thing nap being, sorry nap being oh, for, sorry go ahead sorry this is the first time yeah, I've actually had ahead. a fellow I've had, the first time I've had a fellow Lalbert on so we have to we have to, <laughs> we ahead, have to translate sorry, sorry. Uh, yep. non-aggression <laughs> principle essentially is uh at least as the, the Lalbert version of the, the, the non-aggression principle is that you never hurt anybody else and you never exert any force in your life because then you're a horrible piece of shit. Um, I, I don't think Elliot or I subscribe to that interpretation of the non-aggression principle because it's kind of, um, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, right. Yeah, but the idea is, um, you know, um, I, I, I tend to think of the nap um, maybe just because I'm a dork in a, mm -hmm. in a Bill and Ted sense, it's be excellent to each other, right? Um, mm -hmm. this the, it's the don't do, it's the golden rule. That's at least how I interpret it. Don't, don't do things to people that you would not like to have done to you. Um, and this sort of the weak, I like this idea of like the weak, the weak nap is, um, you, you know, maybe not even so much of an aphorism as it is, as it is a description. You tend to people, we won't say use, no you statements, yep. only I statements. <laughs> I tend to, sorry, we're in therapy now. I tend to aggress less, meaning I tend to be less of a dick to people who are close to me. Um, and I think, you know, um, um, uh, Grossman's uh, references a lot of E.E. E. Evans Pritchard, if anyone's read Evans Pritchard. I know about Pritchard because of, you know, grad school and shit. But um, Pritchard did a lot of work with um, indigenous groups around the world. Um, and uh, Grossman's, you know, looking at all these various indigenous um, cultures and looking at like, geez, you know, like when they fight in, when there's an internal conflict, it tends to be non, um, non-fatal. Maybe they'll just like beat each other up to settle some, you know, feud. It's like, you know, fisticuffs versus, oh, we're going to fight the neighboring tribe who is definitely not us. Okay, we're going to use spears and just kill them if we can. Um, so this this idea of like ratcheting up or down of levels of violence during disputes um, based on sort of proximity, um, you know, in a, in a, in a very pre-modern society that would probably be like literal physical proximity, you know, the, the people who are farther away from you, you probably, um, whether you like them less or not, they're, you're, you're not going to come into contact with them as frequently. So if you do come into contact with them and you have to fight, you're going to probably be more vicious right well, like and, if, and you know oh, if, if i can yeah, please oh, ahead, interject sorry. yeah please oh yeah yeah i was gonna just and you're and you're regular who, who like you rambling or to hate me so sorry everybody but basically um the the other thing i would addend to that which is actually super critical for this particular article and i think it really uh helps put the nail in the coffin of like uh, is that in addition to going easy on people who are closer to you uh, you, there is a, a, an agreement, cultural agreement to stop all feuds amongst people who are close S to you when somebody further away from you declares war, right? So for instance, if a, if a far away tribe, right, who is, who, or, or sub clan, whatever, is yeah. attacking one of your sub clans, you're mm -hmm. in the middle of shit. You, you drop everything, say, we'll get back to beating each other up later or spearing each other even. We got to go fight that uh, 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 other clan over there. And if a foreigner invades, we're all together. Screw yeah. everything we have for everybody all hands on deck. We'll fight among us later. And I yeah. think that's really, really cool. It is. And it, 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 there's so many historical examples of this. I mean, I guess just because of my family history and just general historical interest, one thing that comes to mind is you know, Scottish clans, um, you know, uh, like leading up to the Battle of the Culloden when the fucking British just, anyhow, sorry. Uh, still angry about that one, even though I didn't live in that area. Uh, but like, you know, the Scottish clans were not like friends with each other all the time. Like there was like cattle raiding and like murders and shit and like 
sometimes open warfare, but the instant the 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 English are like, we're we're gonna we're gonna make you you know abandon your ways and force you to convert to Protestantism and abandon your language. They're like, well, fuck you. We're all gonna get together, and we might hate each other, but we hate you more. Uh, so uh, have a have a sword in the face. Uh, you know, th that's just one example that comes to mind. Um, there's a um, Elliot. I don't know if you watched the uh, the Tim Dillon show. There was an episode recently of the Tim Dillon show with Curtis Yarvin on it. And we've talked a bit on this channel about Yarvin and Yarvin brought up this sort of um, this quote that's oft repeated and it's hard to know exactly where the quote really comes from. I've heard it's a Somali proverb. I've heard it's a Bedouin proverb. I think it's just a proverb, but I think it, it I'll, I'm going to read it here just because this is exactly what you've been describing and what the article describes too is me and my nation against the world me and my clan against my nation, me and my family against the clan, me and my brother against the family, me against my brother. So it's sort of, yeah, these like ratcheting, you can ratchet up or ratchet down levels of, I guess, for lack of a better term, feud allegiances, where you're like friend, frenemy, frenemies, like, you know, like you can slide between friend and enemy distinction pretty seamlessly. Um, in a lot of societies, this has been the way that humans have lived. A really, you could make an argument for the majority of our existence as a species, because most of human history is not even with a state, it's tribal life. And, um, you know, uh, so you can imagine that like majority, most of the humans who've ever lived have lived in a tribal setting. Um, and this is, I would argue that this is innate um, I'm not saying, I'm not arguing for or against living in a tribal society, but I would say that there's an evolutionary past of humans living this way um, that's shaped by our environment, as you quite rightly point out. And so, um, maybe well, and, and, and is it, is it like Dunbar's number? What's the dude's number who is like, you can only reasonably track like about 125 to 150 human beings at a time, right? I forget. I forget. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that feels right, but I will have to double check that. Yeah. Right. Regardless, it, the, the point holds that like, yeah, humans are, are not really set up um, to, yeah. Like to think about a nation uh, like, or, or to think about, you know, even like, maybe even a region is kind of hard, right? Like you, I guess, you know, I, I tend to identify more strongly with the part of the world that I'm from, as opposed to the country of the world that I'm from. from. Um, but even then, like Pacific Northwest, that's a big place. There's lots of people, right? Like I can't know everybody there. I can't know everybody in, in, in the city I live now. So like, yeah, it's this, it's weird. It's hard for humans to do this. Um, and I guess for me, uh, the the real you know the real thing that's fascinating, particularly in our current modern American context, is how do you how do we attempt to prevent feud that goes down the really bad path of like mass liquidation? Um, because I know it's stunning and brave, Elliot, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say it. I I, I think genocide is bad. Um, I'm against it, and I know that I'll get some hatred from that now. Uh, I like to think people that watch this channel are good people. Uh, but, no, but like um, murder is bad. Oh, so I see you're you're one of those you're one of those Fapis Persians. Yeah, okay, oh, Mr. Yeah. Anti Assyrian, Mr. Yes. Anti Babylonian. <laughs> like, I know what <laughs> what a cuck. I'm against genocide. Yeah, anyhow. Um, so when you spend too much time on Twitter, you get things like that. You're like, what? Um, no, like, I, I don't, I don't like humans killing each other. I, I don't like violence. Um, and I'm definitely not a, definitely not a, a, a pacifist, but I don't like violence. Like, have you ever been in a fight? Like all it takes is just being in one actual fight and you go, this is not fun. Um, this is not, I don't like this. This is hurting. You can win a fight and it's not fun. You're like, what's happening? Um, so I don't know. I just, that's my big thing living in the world. And again, I know Sunny and Brave to say is like, how do I, you know, how do I encourage, encourage the good both in myself and amongst my fellow man to use a patriarchal term uh, and, and D you know, and disincentivize the bad. And um, perhaps I'm jumping a bit ahead in the, in the argument and that's fine. We can jump around. Um, I don't know. I think there's maybe some insights in this article. I'm not saying it, you know, provides the quote unquote answers to human existence or to human or, you know, societal organization. But I, I do think that 
you know, as a person, I would say, who's pretty radically pro-Western in terms of Western ideals, I do think people in the West ignore other societies and other historical periods sort of at our peril. And we don't really look at how like the goods and bads of our own way of life versus the goods and bads of other people. Um, and I do think it's useful to, um, you know, step outside of the West is always the best all the time um, and, and look at how other people, you know, other parts of the world either now or, or in the past have, have attempted to find some sort of, I guess, as the, as the t- uh, title of the article says, some sort of peace amidst all of the feuding. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, uh, not to get into too many details, but I'm, I'm assuming uh, Elliot, you come from a family, right? Cause everyone does. Yep. You, you exist, you come from a family. Like, does every single person in your family get along with each other all the time? I'm like, oh, of course not, right? Of course not, right? Yeah, absolutely like, not. Do you have Do you have siblings? Yep, I have siblings. Yep. <laughs> Did you ever get in fights with your siblings? <laughs> oh, all the time, and and uh, to the point where eventually, when we became adults, so we kind of buried several different hatchets, right? We we got adorable, you know, sibling tattoos to commemorate this wonderful experience because. <laughs> Importantly, not all siblings continue to like each other into age. And that's true for tribal society. It's not like it was Pollyanna. Some siblings hated each other until they died. But like this article says, there was still a social protocol about how hard you went against siblings, right? Right. Yeah, I, I, I guess my only point is, you know, to, 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 you know, to sort of allow the audience here to think like, you know, it, it, if you have a family, and I hope you do, and I hope you have a good family. And I know not everyone does, but even in a good family, there's there's feuds. Like, and it, hopefully they're small, right? Um, hopefully they're they're forgiven, and hopefully you bury the hatchet or multiple hatchets in, in Elliot's case. That's fine. Um, just make sure they're all buried all the way down. Uh, don't bring them up again, uh, because feuding, while sort of natural in the sense that like, right? We all live with. Um, even, even in, a, in a rich, um, you know, we we're talking about this before the recording, even in a rich quote unquote post-scarcity world, humans still have like, there's still, humans still crave things, right? We crave acceptance, power, wealth, you know, love, sex, whatever, right? Faster cars, nicer houses, humans just crave things. And that this is sort of just how it is, right? Um, so you're always gonna have that struggle, that feud, if you will, but, yeah, I guess for me, like I've been saying, and perhaps I'm just repeating myself, but um, how do you find, the, the article is looking at like, how do societies attempt to find peace and maybe a better term would be equilibrium amidst the strivings of humans, which, I mean, I, I guess I'll be the first one to say it. Like there are some things, Elliot, that I want in the world that I think are pretty reasonable, right? Like there's just reasonable things that I would like. I also fully admit that there's things that I want in the world that are completely unreasonable, completely unrealistic. Um, how do I, you know, how do we or I, together with you and everyone else, ensure that, like, you know, that 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 we can figure out a way to distribute, perhaps not centrally, we hope, the goods capital G, the good things in the world in a way that we don't like and that doesn't devolve into just violence. Um, but right. you know, and, yeah, so and, and I, I wonder, like, I wonder, because, because what's interesting about this article is that they, they kind of to, um, you know, to, to maybe like a, a and of course, I'm not gonna like, pretend like I've read a lot of Yarbin's work, right. But right. To, to maybe like, a, what we could say a lol Yarbin, right, or a lol uh, uh, neo reactionary, right? Yeah, um, I've been using the term. I've been using the term Yarvinian because it's super fucking pretentious. Like in a <laughs> Yarvinian di- uh, di- framework, yeah. Um. Right, because like <laughs> a, a sort of naive view of that would be to say, oh, you just need to establish, re-establish uh, pyramidal hierarchies where the pyramid comes to a point. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, well, actually, that's not really what this article is saying. What this article yeah. is saying is that there are these various hierarchies with respect to inner and outer, but that that whole system is actually held together by lateral right interdependencies. Yeah. And, and this comes to like what is a fundamental thesis of mine, which is that the cities are crazy because they have no bears. Right. Um, yeah. And, and well, I and can elaborate from, on that, but can, it's an can, obvious can, point, I think. Can, can we point out where you're from? 
and why bears. Oh yeah, I'm from Alaska, right? Yeah, so So. (laughs) you're somebody who's yeah, (laughs) you're used to bears. Yeah, Um, I have seen one bear in the wild, and it was not fun, and I went away. Um, So that's my. And it became really clear to you in that moment what was real and what was fake. (laughs) Yes, it's like, uh, that's a black bear with cubs. Shit. Well, maybe, I mean, of course, I'm not thinking this. I'm like, my, my, my lizard brain is making me just do that. It's all automatic, right? Away, away, go away, just get away. It hasn't seen you, so don't let it see you and just go away. Obviously, I'm still here. I was not chased by a bear, thank God. And, you know, all's well that ends well, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, that was, I, I, I'm, from, I'm from, you know, the city. I was out in the woods not knowing really what I was doing. Um, yeah, my, my impression, and I could totally be wrong, Elliot, but my impression is, impression is that in Alaska, you just like ride orca whales and you, you have bears as friends and there's bald eagles and they, they land on your arm and you feed them things and they fly away. That's my idea of Alaska. So yeah, but it's a good point. The, 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 um, the cities are crazy because there are no bears. Um, right. And, and, and so what yeah. I mean by that, to unpack that a little bit, and this is totally put up by the article, right, is that when you are not interdependent on people, right, you are independent of them, which means that since you take no dependency on them, they really are a huge risk. It, you know what I mean? Like you basically have to first build that trust, build that that lateral integration with each other so to speak right and uh then you can actually do business versus if there is like bare nature out in front of you uh and it's like hey this person's gonna freeze to death how much do i hate them look i might not like them very much but i know their wife and kids i've met them in the in the safe way right, right. or the or the cars or the c-mart before that because right. that's how small town people think and essentially like it's like yeah i'm gonna save them from nature and when you have that reality in front of you at every moment that hey you know what uh, i can only be so much of a dick to this person because this literal human body in front of me might have to pull me out of a ditch one day well right. you know what i'm not gonna let it get that intense whereas city people they can just disconnect from each other and say you know what i'm never talking to you again and they yep. can get away with it yep yeah because it's that weird kind of thing where the more people, it, it feels counterintuitive. I think about this a lot. It feels so counterintuitive, um, I guess, at least to me. Um, maybe it's not. That the more people there are, the easier it is to get away with things. Because you would think there's that part of you that thinks, oh, well, like, there's fewer people. Fewer people are going to see you do things. It's like, yeah, but everyone's knows everybody, knows everybody, because it's a small place. And you don't want to, you know, freeze to death in the winter. Um, and you, yeah, there's this reciprocal. It's not about like, I like that you point this out. It's not about quote unquote, liking each other, whatever the heck liking each other means. It's about like the only way we are going to get through, we got to get through this thing called life as Prince would say, um, is to, you know, to, to, to look at the bare minimum to make sure we're not being eaten by wolves. Or, or bears or, or whatever right. right like and when yeah, you like, don't have that natural pressure everybody is too safe right yeah and so it's this weird thing in humanity and, and i'm not saying humans do I've, I've met people who do this consciously and they're fucking insane and i stay away from them speaking of staying away from people um <laughs> but i would say even just as a sort of a as a um emergent phenomenon um humans when there's not natural danger will fucking create danger Yes. They'll quote unquote start shit. Um, maybe I'm just speaking from my neighborhood in the, in the city where I live. Pe- there's like a meth problem here. Um, and, and then you say, well, that's every city in Seattle. Or in, oh, Seattle. Uh, that's every city in, uh, in, in, <laughs> in, in the U.S. Well, true. But like there's people in our neighborhood. We'll just I'll just see people starting things. And I'm like, can we not have yet another drive by? Because bullets go places that they're not intended. Um, it's like people get so maybe bored is the wrong term. And I know I'm not trying to downplay the like the effects of poverty on 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 violent crime. There's a clear correlation. My point is whether people crave violence or not. If there is not this external bear eating me, you like kind of go and find a bear sort of right? fill in the blanks for bear. You find some danger, particularly if you're a young male. Uh, and you don't have, you know, stable family, 
or community. You just like go find danger because, well, you don't have to be a evolutionary biologist to say, because for most of human existence, the men went out and like killed things. <laughs> or each well, other and, 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 and kill things. That's kind of what you that's did. Where, yeah. So well that's that's where I love to point out. I'm like, hey, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this very I've had to get like I, I'm kind of out of patience for a lot of people with respect to some of this philosophical debates type yeah. things. I and I get I, I go straight to like hardcore as I possibly can. I say, especially to progressive women. I will say, okay you naturally give birth to a baby. You claim that you want to be a mother. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. You have given birth to a baby. It is one years old. A panther comes in the freaking house like a tiger. A tiger comes in the house, right? And has, the, has your baby in its jaws. Do you pick up a gun and shoot it? Yes, no. Do you let your baby that you birthed die or do you kill the tiger? Yes, no. And, and if they can't answer that question, I say you are unserious about having children. You fail to understand how your body will react in that situation, yeah. which means that you're fully disconnected from your body. And that is fine. You will figure it out when you have to physically go through this transformation like exactly. every progressive does, right? Because right. I'm like, no, if you would not save your child, then your child should not exist because Darwinianly speaking, you do not understand how to defend them from danger or find a dude who will defend them from danger since you refuse to, right? right. And yeah. I, I kind of have this like Darwinian sieve, sieve that I'm like, hey, let's see if it's even possible for a society to adopt your maxim. It's kind of like a twist on cons a categorical imperative. It's like, yeah. hey, if a species would die, if every level of the species behaved like your moral thing, that species cannot exist evolutionarily speaking. And so we probably shouldn't do that shit either because it obviously won't work. Yep. Yep, that's very well said. Um, let's quickly define Kant's categorical imperative because- uh, I'm sorry there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. This is the theory heavy episode and that's totally okay. Uh, we like it. It's just, I, I, I try to cast as broad of a net as possible. And, and you know, my, my, my whole thing is to get people excited about thinking. So um, uh, regardless of whether you agree with me or Elliot or anyone else or not. Uh, it, yeah, so Kant's categorical imperative, uh, I can define it, but you brought it up. So I'll let you define it really quickly. Sure. So I believe the string literal definition of it is uh, essentially uh, adopt, uh, only adopt moral maxims, right? So only adopt a, a, a statement is moral if and only if everybody else living by that statement would lead to the to a better society essentially or if, if yeah. that is consistent with life essentially, right? right? Which is a nerdy way to say you know, if your morality can't scale up to the mainstream, then it's a uh, shit morality. Yeah, um, and I, I think, I think, um, I, yeah, uh, we should do an episode on Kierkegaard because I'm, I'm, I have, I take some issue with Kant, but I think his heart's in the right place, particularly in, mm. you know, he's trying to, Kant is trying to sort of quasi scientifically define what is right and wrong, which I would argue is like, it's fun to try. Um, except that it doesn't really work, but I think it, it doesn't work overall in all instances, but in this particular, uh, what you're talking about here with the, the the panther example, yeah, it makes sense because somebody who's not willing to sacrifice, you know, one hopes that you don't have to sacrifice your life for the next generation, but you should probably sacrifice something for the next generation. Whether, e even if that's something so small as like, I'm going to make a stand, take a stand about certain issues that I think are important because I want I want to have a society in the future that's not shit to live in. Or worst case scenario, just doesn't exist because everyone's died or, or, or you know, or, or has just allowed the Panthers to, to eat them all because, you know, didn't want to have to do anything. Yeah. So, right, because they yeah. have some sort of moral imperative that says somehow the panther's life as an animal is less valuable than my baby's life as an animal. And I'm like, you got to be goddamn kidding me here. At least like, but anyway, I could rant about that. Sorry. Well, it, it, no, it's, it's, it's a thing you get with um, animal rights people. Um, and one of, my, one of my favorite, not to get, yeah, to, to finish up the tangent just a little bit, one of, my, one of my favorite things that I like to bring up to white progressive um, animal rights activists is that no, yeah, no indigenous people taught, they have never met indigenous people. I have friends uh, from various indigenous backgrounds from around the world. And the, none of them are like animal rights people. They care about nature a lot, of course. They don't want animals to go extinct, of course, because they're not insane. 
but they're like, <laughs> well, the, the, like they understand that animals die and that humans have to eat. And like, there's like, I have never met an indigenous vegan is what I'm trying to say. And I've actually asked it, my indigenous friends about this and they laugh at vegans. They like actively mock them and make fun of them. And it's the most glorious thing you've ever heard because it is really stupid when you think about it. This idea that like my number one moral, you know, imperative in the world is that no animal suffers, you know, Meanwhile, if somebody's literally dying by animal attack in front of me, I won't do anything. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, mean, I, vegans, I mean, are these people vegans serious, are, or are they just psychopaths, sociopaths, no, or something? Or what I, I, is, I think they're religious fundamentally, yeah, and I, I don't mean that in a trite way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like the only vegans I respect, by the way, are Jains uh, because they are hardcore, right? Yeah. If you look up Jains dietary practices, like I'm like, okay, if a vegan was that, then I'm down with that shit because that is serious shit. But basically, I think it comes down to not to totally derail, but the fact that on average, a leftist person is somebody who wants to jump face first into the void, and that a rightist person believes that the void should be fought off a little bit longer, right? Yeah. That it's not yet time to go back to the void. Yeah, well, and, and from a, and again, this is a this is a Tolkien friendly space. This is well, this is the long defeat, right? This is Tolkien's long defeat. We are all fighting, at least we should be fighting the long defeat, and that that we find communion and fellowship with one another in the long defeat, and that the long defeat does not mean you throw your hands up and go, well, we're going to be defeated anyhow, uh, and like let yourself be chewed to death. Um, the long defeat means all of us are mortal unless we're elves but we're not all of us are mortal so um we cherish life and we preserve life whenever possible and we preserve the true good and beautiful and in this extreme example the true good and beautiful would be that my child is not eaten by a panther um so if you learn anything from this episode this rambling theory, theory heavy episode people it's that uh do not let children be eaten by large animals or even small animals uh or if you do, then you're you're you know you will be edited out of the gene pool as is as is required. Exactly. Although it does make me wonder for the people who who kind of actively uh, sacrifice <laughs> their children to the great god Demos. I, I kind of wonder sometimes how what will that's a topic for another episode. Anyhow, uh, it's a rambly one, but that's fine. It's you know it's it's a Sunday. We're all cringing, having to go back to the real world. So we we Two get ADHD to be, brains talk to each other. Yes, I know. Uh, that's all right. Uh, the people who show up and watch these, 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 uh, have already had to deal with me act like this. So, t you know, adding another person in, it's not a big deal. Um, so feud, um, yeah, the, the, the basic to sort of to say it yet again, in a different way, uh, the, the basic idea here is acknowledging that there will always be feud, whether that is actual feuding fights between people in a family or between families, or it's something just as general as like, I'm unhappy with my life. Things are bad, right? There's always gonna be something that's frustrating. There's gonna be struggle. You cannot remove struggle from the human condition because humans will literally create it as we've been talking about. It, in, in, when there is no external, you know, bear. Uh, well, maybe I'm gonna get angry at my, my neighbor, Bill, because he just keeps trimming my hedges. And if he doesn't stop trimming them, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna show him, right? Um, humans will create this struggle. It's almost like humans need this external stimuli. Um, so when humans live not in a state of nature, whether that actually ever exists, but let's say it does, um, when humans come together in some sort of group, family, clan, tribe, nation, you know, province, whatever, um, there, will be, there, there will be feud. The idea that Grossman's push, pushing here is that the more um, the more interdependencies between individuals and smaller groups of people there are, the less violence, or at least extreme violence, there is. And it, and that when there is violence, it will tend to be more measured. So there'll be some sort of you know um, for any veterans out there, there's some ROE. There's rules of engagement. There's ways that you fight. Right. That there's sort of a that there perhaps there's a code of honor or there's like a let's not kill women and children right or something like that or let's not completely salt the earth or something like that because even if it's devolved the situation is devolved into warfare there's this understanding that well these people 
they kind of live right next to us and like if we go full melee on them they might go full melee on us and it doesn't mean we like them but maybe we don't want to have such total war because it could be easily visited upon us um if not by that that group then by some other group um yeah essentially how I read like this. yeah i did I, I would say like a um a different spin on it because i think that's a great spin yeah, i think one, a that's different my spin yeah yeah, yeah, and I, I think you're correct, and so I'm just going to agree with you in, in, in different terms, I think, okay. which is to say... You don't have to that, agree with me, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I think, I th well, at least agree with what he's saying, right, and yeah. kind of put it, it in different sense. terms, although yeah. I totally agree with what he's saying, because as a, as a philosophical anarchist, like, this is what we say all the freaking time, right, which right. is that the sinews of society were cut with the progressive era, right? Now, that that's dividing see it's interesting right because if we go through a, a sort of standard caste system approach right like the you know the, uh, brahma's head was made from this cast and his shoulders blah blah it's Indian yeah, mythology yeah. go look it up i won't explain it so basically yeah. point being is that if we think about the i would argue that the enlightenment and hume's guillotine right uh, aka uh the is ought proposition right or the is ought problem that severed our heads right our, our our thoughts from our from our bodies right so the head the the way we think and the way we are were our embodiment was se severed by the enlightenment and yeah. then the, the 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 muscles were pulled from the bones of of human society in the progressive era where the traditional family unit of like grandparents parents and children were pulled apart through various different programs uh social security is one um you know elder welfare is another the american you know the american medical association is another actually and um, then obviously world war one world war two and also well and also too um this is a thing that the great linguist um john mcwhorter who also does political um political commentary, um, who is a progressive, but he's one of the few progressives I love. I love John McWhorter. Um, he, this is a thing that, cause I'm a stupid white person, what the fuck do I know? But I was watching this, you know, John McWhorter talk about this once and I, I didn't realize how much of like, um, I th was it affirmative action or one of those kind of uh, post- uh, It was the American rights. Medical Association, yeah, almost it, certainly. It, it, it was way before that. African-American communities in this way that, that was like really brutal. And I hadn't really, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, and, right. and, and it was really eye-opening to me and really depressing at the same time. Um, and, um, so yeah, because like, you, yeah, if you, I mean, like, actually I just had a thought, uh, this isn't, so essentially what we saw in this article were sort of informal relations. Basically the example he gives is look, you know, you can definitely have beef with the next guy over to you, but maybe you'll settle that beef in winter because during the yeah. summer months, you got to get the heck away from your winter village into your summer village where the lowlands are. You all yeah. got to play nice for the time that all your tribes are close to each other because, hey, you're going to have to go, you're going to have to go to your ox through somebody else's yard. And this is right. sort of, I think, a counterexample to the standard really stupid uh, uninformed critiques of anarcho capitalism. There's lots of great critiques of it, but the really dumb ones is like, oh, well, if you're all isolationist and, and you don't believe that easement is a legal requirement, how will people get from place to place? And I'm like, dude, we have examples of this literally throughout time. So, yeah, uh, right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is a primary example of that. And to your point, in that early 20, 1900s with, with it, they basically, it's, uh, institutions like the AMA, like the New Deal, decimated friendly societies, right? Yeah. And so in an institutional way, we had this institutional, you know, uh, 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 you know, interdependency structure in terms of, oh, I'm an odd fellow and I'm a part of this doctor's friendly society. I'm part of this housing friendly society, yeah. right? And these on an institutional level were the tribal affiliations. I'm, you might I'm, be part part of, of the, I'm part of a church but, congregation. Yeah, I'm part of a church congregation. Yeah. I'm part yeah. of like the, the 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 sons of Norway, right? And all yeah, these something. different on an institutional, like it's, and obviously African American communities and everybody, yeah. all the other communities had these too, right? I just yeah. list the ones because I'm like also white. But basically, yeah. like this is a thing, right? This is the thing where the the if you look at the administrative state, they purposefully uh unknit right they yeah. purposefully cut apart all of these required sinews and basically boiled it down chopped it up 
into a meat paste, which is what we have now. And they crammed it into a can. And now you, you, you fry it and eat it with, you make spam musubi out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a meat paste. Yeah, it's, um, that's very po poetically said. And uh, I'm glad that this is, will be recorded for posterity for the, for our <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's, it's, a, it's the meat paste, you know, progressive uh, world that we all, all of us here were born into, right? Um, so I think now is probably a good time to, because we're talking about, you're talking about the progressive era to shift mm -hmm. into perhaps, now I have my theories and I have my thoughts, but I am more interested in what you have to say, Elliot, um, mm -hmm. because I live in my head and I know what I think. I'm more interested in what other people have to say. Um, how, do you find perhaps resonances or um, areas from this sort of analysis of feud in the article that are areas where this really overlaps quite strongly with our current political situation? I'm going to say specifically American political situation and or perhaps lessons to be learned um, from looking at feuds in, um, in sort of pre-modern societies? A big question on purpose to invite you to speak and think about that. Yeah. The lessons to be learned about. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Did you? Yeah. No. To... That's just that's that's the that's the very stupid teacher question designed to be like think. To let us know what oh. you have to say. Yeah. No. No. I love it. I mean, and basically, so for me, for me, uh, I what I came away with this article saying is firstly. It doesn't matter about the society. This is not a, a Western versus whatever the heck thing. This is a human at a certain level of uh, resource allocation and industrial output. This yep. is an example of what happens at those scales. Now, those scales still occur with an industrial society. It just means you actually have to have enough wealth and power to be relevant, right? So that is to say, if I'm the CEO of Coca-Cola, this shit happens all the time with the CEO of Pepsi, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, me and the CEO of Pepsi may have to share factories sometimes. We may have to share logistics chains sometimes. Doesn't mean we're not competing still. Doesn't yep. mean we won't, you know, put each other the barrel where we can get the chance but it means that me and pepsi versus versus you know the meat industry or me and pepsi and the meat industry versus cars right like yeah. this happens still in oh, yeah. societies where you as a human being are actually relevant which by the way is none of us we are not relevant yeah. just to be clear within yeah. the broader scope of reality right so that's point one and then point two yeah. i kind of invite people to think about this in terms of take the human totally out of it. I've been reading also a lot of accelerationists recently, which is why I started reading postmodernists because almost all accelerationists are postmodernists at the end of the day. Um, you You've know, been reading Land, Nick, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been reading Nick Land, who's super yeah. fascinating. And basically he would say, hey, this article is talking about um, he would say cybernetic, right, which is just any system that is self-aware, more or less able to observe its own preferences, I guess is another way to put it, right, is that you are capable of making observations about the universe and capable of looking at preferences as like, hey, do I prefer that? Do I not prefer that? Boom. That's a cybernetic system, applies to animals, applies to computers, applies to anything with, think about it like a camera, an input device, and anything that can act upon the universe, output devices, and that has enough of a brain to model itself a little bit, right? Any cybernetic system that is in relation with other cybernetic systems will start to exhibit this exact behavior right? Expect this sort of shit from AIs. It's not going to be AIs versus all humans. It's going to be AIs and some humans against other AIs that are competing with this interest. And this is just a fact of any resource dependent, uh, uh, you know, a, a cybernetic system, yep. right? And so it goes way beyond humans, right? To be very clear. And yep. so if you think about it just from the human lens, is there a, is there a, a higher preference at some point that would bring you into conflict with another person with a similar preference and would require you to compete in a zero sum version of that. Will that ever happen? Yes, it will ever happen. So buckle up, be ready to do some sort of quote unquote warfare, whether it be with, with, with spears and rocks or clubs or whether it be with regulation and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Mandatory mergers, you know what I mean? Like hostile yeah. mergers. Yeah, yeah. No, well said. And if I can, if I can piss off the other, the Lawberts too, um, you know, uh, uh, there, there's scales of violence, and uh, there, there's 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 scales of violence, and and I know that on Twitter, 
The Lawberts love to say that any action you do in the world that involves anything involving a system is, is violence. And while that may be true in a very autistic way, there is a, a qualitative there's a there's a there's a qualitative difference between punching someone in the face and voting. <laughs> and 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 maybe it's all, yeah, it's all perhaps it's all sort of violence in the end. Um, maybe. Uh, but there's a there's a big difference between different kinds of force in the world, right? And so yeah, you're gonna have these these pressures exist and they kind of always will exist in one way or another. Um, my stance, speaking for myself, is and perhaps this is because I'm hitting kind of a, I hate the term because it's so cringe, but a post-libertarian, whatever, whatever. Uh, I would rather have sort of force enacted in a society that doesn't involve punching versus uh, punching someone. And they're not the same thing. Um, well, and I think that's a really perhaps I've thing broken, about the map, right? I hope I've perhaps I've broken the Roth Rothbardian system, and I don't really care anymore. I, I, there is a difference between voting and shooting someone. There just there just is. Um, no, no. So I yeah, think yeah. I think this is really important, and I'm not necessarily trying to mount well, some sort of epic defense, but but all I'm saying is that yeah. actually. For the libertarians, right? I would, I would, I would encourage them to reconsider that it's just the application of force, and right. we apply force in all different ways, yep. right? Like I, technically, it's a force when I present somebody with a contract, right? You could say maybe it's a negative force, and that I'm offering them to pull them into an agreement with me, as opposed to forcing something down their throat in like a positive force direction, like right. I'm, I'm projecting something at them. But we're still going to have to learn how to manipulate force at the end of the day. Like it's my competing you know, agency, uh, protection agency versus your uh, protection agency. Well, that's still force, even when you force. call up them, you know, and say, hey, could you settle this dispute? This is still in a certain way and acting a very light force, a non-destructive force. And yeah. it's okay to like hold your two-year-old's hand and, and restrain them from going about the street. That's force, that battery technically, but like, yeah. you know, it's still worth better than them getting hit by a car. And so- oh, yeah. You know, you don't have to be a consequentialist to be a pragmatist. Elliot, that's you've, all I'm saying. you've you've broken the nap, and you're a statist, and you're horrible. And oh no, so I go so much hard cards. Two year old say, kids knows until a kid can assert their Rothbardian right of escape. They are the literal property, chattel property of their parents. End of <laughs> question. Right? At least so, you're consistent. I mean, At least you're consistent. Right. God bless you. Yeah. This yeah. doesn't admit for 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 twenty fourth trimester abortions, but you know what? Fuck it. Property rights are are the most important thing, not human life. <laughs> uh, and I think this is I think this is again a topic for today. I, I've. I, you know, in the past three months or so, I've had somewhat of a, of a change. I still really like libertarians. I think I call myself mm -hmm. one just because people don't really know, like, what are you? I'm like, oh, a libertarian. But right. I, I think I think I'm just a realist at heart. But also, I I, I think, um, you know, I, I think you can. I think it's about interpretation. I I, I what yes. changed a lot of my mind was reading um, Hoppe. Hans Hermann Hoppe changed. I think I think it, it he presents a kind of libertarianism that does not. Um, descend into this mindless and never-ending um, deliberations about what is or is not a nap violation. Um, it just, yeah. In any case, there's going to be force in the world, and there's going to be conflict. It's just going to happen. Um, one potential lesson, that's maybe a strong word, but something that we could potentially learn from looking at sort of pre-modern feuding societies is that um, having close contact with other humans tends to reduce the severity of violence. And this right. is like fucking demonstrable, particularly in the 20th century. Um, you have the rise of the technocratic state and you have just like the murder century. I mean, it's just like, you know, Yarvin calls the 20th century, the, 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 it's the age of democracy and it's the age of democide. Like it's just the murder century. You just like so many, so so many people die from their own governments or from competing governments. Um, and, well, and, and it's and, the and rise it's of this insane, um, incredible dehumanization, um, not just of the other, capital O, but of like yourself. And like, you know, World War One, as we've talked about, that ushers in this grand quote unquote century. Um, 
it, it, it's just the, the murder century to me was is you know humans are kind of murder apes right? we were basically murder apes um, and you have to know that and if you forget or you convince yourself that you're quote modern and you have quote democracy um that's all fine and good but if you've convinced yourself that you don't that you're no longer a murder ape um to use a more atheist term or perhaps a fallen person to use a more theological term um you can do no wrong and everything is for progress capital p and of course you're just gonna like exterminate everyone um because i think i think a lot of that to, to sort of to, to look at the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st here through the lens of feud it's um I don't know, I can't help but see that, yeah, like like you said, all these social bonds were severed, um, like in the West particularly, it was, a, it, was a, it was a coordinated program of severing social bonds. There was murder before, but you're gonna get more murder the more you do that because you do not have this reciprocal, you're looking at me and I'm looking at you and we both have to find a way to not completely wipe each other out. You don't have that anymore. There's no more, um, back and forth it, that you, there's that 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 pressure has not maybe been removed from the system but it's been sort of displaced and like you said people in cities can tell themselves or, or to sort of extrapolate outwards people in large technocratic states can tell themselves hey fuck those other people we don't care because what are they going to do to us we have the bomb or whatever you know well, and um, i think, we, we I think it leads to like an actual definition of human that is grounded fully in reality right which is a human is another organism that i see as human right and that's circular but what it's important about that as human part is the as human bit is a potential ally mm -hmm. right a potential ally in a feud right mm -hmm. and i think that is the case and and so people are less human the less likely you are to rally for them and they're more human the more likely you are to rally to them and the thing is is that you know progressives like to pretend that this isn't the reality but when you look at it you know it's them it, it's the it's the critical theorists and the intersectionals right versus the radicals versus the rad femmes right it's the rad femmes right. and the intersectionals and all them against the social democrats or maybe the the stalinist communists and that's all those guys against you know a moderate republican and i think the relevant reason why i bring that up is that we, i promise you guys like some some folks who are not familiar with progressives there is totally infighting and this should oh, yeah. manifest all the time where oh, yeah. the, they don't thank god that that the that essentially thank god that the liberals don't don't recognize order because if they were orderly they would be full-fledged fascists <laughs> right well like, i, I kind of I mean? wonder i i think i think we're i think they're getting more orderly and i think that's part of the reason why we're seeing um i think they're, they're they're getting more orderly and i think people on the right are getting less orderly and i do think that that is part of the reason why there's at least a growing feeling for many of my friends on the right and i don't really know if i'm right whatever the heck i am i have a lot of friends who are sort of probably more right than i am and there is a feeling among a lot of them that there's like they're losing and i don't know how wrong they are um it's hard to they know exactly losing, how right what well they they are losing for yeah. sure right because yeah. it kind of it kind of leads to a definition of progressivism and and conservatism that is known to you and me and i think it's actually way deeper than we realize but tom woods uh and i stole this from tom woods is, is that he said that that conservatives are progressives driving the speed speed limit and i say yes absolutely and it's absolutely. way deeper than actually most people realize it's not right wingers are left wingers driving the speed limit it's particularly conservatives and so what i mean by that is that suppose you have a brick in front of you right the the, the conservative says hey we shouldn't push that brick right and the and the progressive says we should push the brick and so the progressive starts to push the brick and the conservative says hey we shouldn't push it any faster and we shouldn't stop and yeah. this is the issue is that a conservative yeah. says and we shouldn't stop a traditionalist says no we should redrive to the point we were and stop there so this is the issue with conservatism as like a philosophy is that it's only thinking about what was 50 years past not like what is actually required for realization in society so there is no such thing as conservatives versus progressives before you know you have this sort of permanent revolution notion ideologically speaking right but before that it was just hey catholics versus protestants or one religious group versus another religion you have a much more like circular flow of history so to speak if that makes yep. sense right yep 
Yeah, well, that's also Chesterton's wall too, right? Like, like mm -hmm. it's Chesterton's wall in the sense that, you know, before you start taking, I mean, before you start taking apart a wall, figure out why it was there. Which, well, maybe if you find the ruins of, people, of a wall, see if you should rebuild it. <laughs> well, and a lot of people on the right determine uh, interpret that as always have the wall. And that's not really what, how I interpret what Chesterton is saying. What Chesterton is right. saying is figure out what the, because there's walls that probably shouldn't be there. There's, you can right. have bad walls and you can have yes. good walls. And most walls are probably kind of neutral, right? Like, I, I feel like most walls, philosophically understood, are probably somewhat neutral. Um, and so just figure out what the fuck you're doing with the wall. But everyone, you know, freaks out about either rebuilding it 12 miles back or put or, or just completely an, an, annihilating it but nobody thinks about what the wall was there for um exactly and 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 that's again that's not me that's pure chesterton who was far smarter than i'll ever be but i, I think there's something to that um because no i think so walls as borders it, makes for clearly defined distinctions between things and whether that sort of distinctions between clans within a clan society or you know, uh, some sort of broadly defined progressive versus conservative, although as I think I would agree with you, it, those those terms don't really mean a whole lot anymore, or maybe they never meant anything. Um, but yeah, like when you can't have, when you can't even talk about distinctions or when your quote unquote conservative heroes, you know, um, are just as bad as the progressives are almost as bad as the progressives are slightly not as bad as progressives like you're, you're already losing at this point you're, you've already seeded like the ideological ground of like you're, you're just going along with the current thing at a much slower pace which is like that's not a that's not an ideology well, i guess it's kind of an it's not really a position to me that's like a real nothing burger it's like what is that that just says like no stop but you're not going to do anything you know, you're, you're like, please don't do the thing as they're doing the thing. It's like, well, I don't know what, what do you call that? It, it, it's hard for me to even, I guess, to, to, to apply it to the sort of feud theory that I'm working on. When you look at feuds historically, right? Hatfields and McCoys, let's say. Everyone likes Hatfields and McCoys, right? Uh, starts over a pig, but a lot of other things and the civil wars in there too. And it's this whole thing. Um, you can see who is Hatfield and who is McCoy, right? Like when you study um, feuds, historical feuds, and yes, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but you can like see, right? You have group A, group B, and then you have the people in the middle who are being drawn to either side or perhaps they're playing both sides off each other or, you know, you have all these things happen. Pretty much any human conflict, whether it's a feud or it's a war, can, can, can turn, you see this dynamic at play. I think part of the problem, like with what you've been talking about is that you essentially have a feud in the United States right now between quote unquote progressives and quote unquote conservatives. And at their base, like at the people, like the, the lower level people who are not high up in those groups, but really do believe in them, you find stark differences, right? Like you can talk to a progressive in the um, Prius and you can talk to a Trump supporter in the lifted truck. And there's some, there's, there's, those people are clearly different. And I go, okay, makes sense. These people are clearly feuding with each other, right? It's a feud I'm not really involved in, but like Tom Woods, I know which side I would prefer. Um, well, but well, and, and, but but as you go up the hierarchies right. in the group, and all of a sudden you're like, mm -hmm. fucking Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi. I mean, I, are they even feuding, or what? Is, what's going on here? Like, there's a feud happening, but it's so muddled who is on what side when you get to the actual points of power. That it's like really, I think there's actually like, you know, when I started trying to apply the feud model to the US, I'm like, this makes sense initially, right? Because I was thinking about like the, the ideology and the dudes on and the people and the chicks, you know, everybody of any gender on the on the boat on the lower levels, like just the everyday people. But when you look at like sort of the power players, it gets really fuzzy <laughs> because you're like, so they're clearly feuding, but they're not really allied like they think they are, or they're not allied like they say they are. I think it's because it's a feud that's based purely on control and power and not ideology. Maybe that's just me. Perhaps that's an overly easy solution to a very complex problem, likely. But again, I'm just starting with this. I'm starting to develop this sort of feud political theory in the American context as it applies to what we're dealing with right now. I mean, like right now with like the Mar-a-Lago thing and all this stuff. Um, I think well, it's just and, and, and so, so masking, think about it like this. It's, it's think about it like this. There's this 
ideology or power masking as ideology or pretending to be ideology when really it's just power. Uh, It's who wants it more. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's not it's not very profound thing to say, but it's kind of where I'm at. I'm struggling with it. But this is it's it's theory and process. So I guess let's think about it like this. Well, so it's it's kind of like um, if you take so consider the top one percent of seven billion. Right. And then consider the top 0.1% of 7 billion. Right. This is in terms of wealth and power. Right. Right. After a kind of quick point, you ask yourself, how many billionaires are there? And there's about 7,000 across the world, about one, about 10,000. Right. So if you figure all the billionaires and then the top executives create a sort of sort of uh, around the size of this tribe that we're talking about, which I think was like 100,000, right? So yeah. take, take the top 100,000 people and notice how they behave exactly in this way, right? Exactly in this way. And, and there's a certain sense in which like, you know, the problem with, with Marx isn't so much that his class theory is totally wrong. It's that, as usual with any leftist design, it's way too abstract and oversimplified, right? He is correct that people who see themselves as more similar to each other will bond up against the other, and the rich are going to bond up against you because they actually study history, right? And so they recognize, oh, you know what? The French Revolution, we're never going to let that happen again. What are we going to do? Democracy, divide and conquer. Let them, right. let them, you know, vote on nonsense people to keep them separated from us. Besides, we didn't really want to rule anyway, and we're rich enough to delegate to other people, and so it doesn't matter, right? So it's like, yeah, when you get to that tribe, yeah, they feud with each other, and it's over shit that literally won't make sense to you and me because yeah, their right. resources are just so freaking different. Try to explain the thoughts of an elephant to a bacteria, and guess what? You're the bacteria. Yeah. compared to an elephant compared to a billionaire you see what i mean yeah no I, i'm right there with you i i think the thing that's like i guess i don't know I've been, I've been thinking and trying to read more and more about this i just again maybe this is just a part of my further you're not a real libertarian moment you know you get everyone get angry at me oh dear, oh dear. um i don't know if you can i i, I don't know I think as bacteria, which we both as as a bacteria, I identify as a bacterium, um, and my <laughs> pronouns are bact and irium. Um, we're both we're all bacteria here, uh, Elliot, you and I. Um, I just don't see bacteria as changing things. I think it will always be the elephants that change things. Yes, um, because the elephant has an immune system that will yeah. casually destroy you. Yeah. Like it literally will not notice. We as humans didn't notice bacteria until we looked in a microscope. And that's what you are to a billionaire. Yeah. They literally have to look at you through a power, through very sophisticated tools to even be able to see you in particular. Now, of course, they could all wander outside, but I mean, systematically, it's all bacteria, right? Yeah. And so the question is, how do bacteria win, right? They win by being immune, by being unable for the immune system to deal with. So that's the real question about people who are looking to fight against the administrative state is think to yourself or, or, you know, maybe the bacteria need to naturally evolve, right, in a way in which we can take on the immune system and just be useless to the host or kill the host in in that way, uh, because it won't be through mano a mano fighting because it's not a man to man fight. No, I, I, I think I agree with you partially. I also find, maybe this is a completely untenable ideological position to have, could well be. Mm-hmm. Where I'm at right, kind of right now is, is I, I view that that more like sort of decentralized um, strategy that you've just laid out. I, I think I agree with that in theory and whenever possible. And there are times in the real world where that actually does work. But I am mm-hmm. also in the process of being more and more convinced um, by people such as Nima Parvini, the populist delusion, for example, that you really do have to, I'm not saying the bacteria don't have a role to play, but you do need to find an elephant. And I don't mean a Republican. Yeah. You do need to find (laughs) something that is much bigger than you, who doesn't mean the elephant really even cares about you, but the elephant at least sort of kind of doesn't like how the other elephants are doing things. So find something big because you do need to have elites who can push things through because yes, bacteria together, strong, fine and good, but there's just so many bacteria and, you know, 
the way that bacteria tend to organize effectively is behind someone or some group of people who can push things through. Um, again, oh, right. maybe, and maybe I, I want the best of both. Maybe I want my cake and eat it too. I don't know, but I think there's advantage. Uh, there's 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 merit to both sort of ways of viewing political power. Um, oh, and don't get me wrong. Like this yeah. isn't to say, like, oh, we individuals need to revolutionize, right? What I'm kind of saying is actually a totally different thing, into a certain degree, which is like, hey, you know how there's that fun guy right, that, that can take over the brain of an ant yes. and then, you know, the zombie, reproduce and capture yeah, yeah, it, the zombie yeah. ant. Yeah, yeah. So it's much more like, hey, actually, question, who's going to outrank the ruling class very soon? AIs, right, in, in multiple different directions. So the question is, is there the capability? So think about it like this. Used to be, and this is the reason why the Second Amendment is, is getting significantly hemorrhaged right now, but mm -hmm. used to be that a dude with a sword and a horse could could fight everybody, right? right? Then the industrial revolution happened and all of a sudden a gun beats a dude with a horse. So yep. then you had to figure out a way, how do we how do we mentally infect everybody so that they do not choose to use their guns to peasant uprise because God forbid we can't actually fight that, right? So they, yep. they mentally ensnared us, right? Well, right. the next school above that is gonna be learning how to use AI botnets in a permanent sort of 4chan tumbler war against each other, right? Because we're gonna be much smarter than each other uh, or we're gonna, they're, they're, you know, uh, essentially it's like botnets fighting botnets. And, and actually this might happen in a physical sense, right? Because think about it like this, I was really nervous about the robot dogs coming online. Yeah, and then too. I realized, wait, anyone can strap a weapon to that. And anyone <laughs> can build a relatively straightforward AI to, to fight their, rel their relatively sophisticated and government made AI. Which do you think is gonna be better? The open source AI? or the government proprietary the AI open source, pro tip, it's going to be the open source yeah. one, right? So actually there is a bit of hope in that when we fully actually are, when we're thinking about what are the tools that we're going to have, we're actually also going to have robot dogs with AIs fighting their robot dogs with AIs. And guess what? There's a lot fewer elephants than there are of us. And so That's what true. are the ruling class going to do to get away from our robot dogs or our hacking AIs? I don't know. And this is why they're desperately, desperately trying to depopulate right now so they can and they can lower the number of players that they have to fight against, right? Uh, yep. Because they know about the fourth industrial revolution. They've been talking about this for like 30 years. If you go to the WEF pages, the World Economic Forum pages, right? And you read what they're talking about. They talk about this stuff. It's very fascinating to hear their take on it. And so their thought is, is like, hey guys, the, if you hear public, public, public private partnership, what the rich people are actually saying is, hey, hey, a feud is going to happen between us and the littles, and the littles are about to get the, the, the relative uh, power of a nuclear weapon versus us, and we have to figure out how to quash the littles before they have the chance, because, you know, AI and blockchain are likely, possibly going to t be the actual liberty forces for us in my opinion you see what i mean it's yeah. kind of weird but um uh, well, you know you know a lot more about that in reality than i do i am so not a computer person as we were talking about before recording but i am somebody who likes good literature and i'm a huge fan of cyberpunk particularly the work of william gibson and basically what you've described is a neuromancer kind of, of world and i mean gibson has this famous quote that is true that you know the future is already here; it's just not evenly distributed yet. And I think we're seeing more even distribution of the future, and maybe it will be robot attack dogs. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but I kind of can't argue against it because, yeah, even as a even as a even as a normie when it comes to computer stuff, I kind of I do see it going in this way. It's just there's, you can't, barring some sort of like Mad Max type of, you know, incident, you kind of can't go backwards at this point. I just don't think that's feasible i just hope that yeah we're just not all wiped out by opposing forces murder bots i guess in in the process well, that's my right. hope and, kind of yeah and with respect to the whole singularity thing you know i know a lot of people say a lot of scary stuff about ais and there's this very very scary book called super intelligence but here's the thing honestly is that i i went, ran through this thought experiment as a kid when i was 12 i had this horrific thought i was like oh my god what if hitler walked right and 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 we were under a global fascism and that would be terrible and oh my god we're so lucky and then i thought to myself wait a minute hitler was a really really uh really uh uh you know 
he wanted to be the top dog in the entire world. And I thought, you know what? He had a number two guy who also wanted to be top dog in the entire world. I mean, come on. You don't think the secondhand man is like, yep, I got to somebody's secondhand. I'm <laughs> excited to be here and will never, ever go for the top spot. Ridiculous. You don't understand powerful people in that case, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I was like, wait a minute. Even if that happened, as soon as he won, his secondhand man would wipe him out. And then all of a sudden, you'd have a feud amongst those secondhand and thirdhand mans. And after, as they feud with each other, the whole thing would fall apart. And we would be back to probably like around where we are country-wise, right? Because people who are further down the food chain, I would encourage people to watch Rules for Rulers by CGB Gray. If you really want to get this nailed through your head, how this is like an actual part of power. One of the things that is frequently level about libertarians is like, oh, you guys don't understand power. And it's like, well, dude, like I'm not saying that we should use power as a crutch though and i think power is very clearly explained in the rules for rulers episode because it demonstrates like how power is maintained essentially um and so you know it's sort of like as we say a a a state would only be able to simulate the free market if it somehow acted exactly like the free market would would but it's going to be slower so therefore it's always going to be behind what a market could do right Anyway, sorry, I don't yeah, mean to no, no, it's a, it's touch a, you there. It's a, yeah, no, it's it's things to think about, and these are all good jumping off places for we we hope uh, future episodes. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I should probably go. No, yeah, no, it's fine. Let's uh, let you want to let's just try to um, let's try to find some sort of conclusion. I'll just ask one little sort of concluding bit here to just kind of wrap it up. I don't want to just end it. Uh, right lessons do you did you have any i've been sort of teasing that and then we went on we went on tangents and that's fine <laughs> lessons that maybe or or things did did reading this change the way you view our current political situation because it did uh, for me but i'm just curious me, if it did for you no not me personally but it affirmed that my analytic framework was more correct than i imagined right yeah because yeah. I think about political feuds exactly like this in terms of, you know, my brother and and uh, and my countrymen against the foreigner. Yeah. That's exactly Proximity. how. Yeah. That's exactly how the ruling class sees it, right? And and the relevant parties that are proximal to them are all very powerful, as opposed to the relevant proximities to you, which are not powerful at all. Yeah. And so the reason why they don't care about you and the reason why they don't acknowledge you on the because i was like why why is the new york times seem like it's written for other rich people it's like because it's, they're not talking is. to you dude they're yeah, letting you they're read not talking. it right yeah yeah and it's sort of like a hint in how to get into higher management think like this right but right. you know every billionaire is on the take necessarily the epstein thing proved this without a doubt right right how do you how do you keep a billionaire in check through scandal right, right. that's the only way you can do it blackmail because what else you got on that they all have all right. the money and power that they could possibly want. It's got to be something else. And that's why there's a huge ass blackmail ring at that top level. And why you don't have to sign up to a blackmail ring to get a rite of passage. You might have to sign up for a vaccine, right? right? Like the, the, yeah. the types of things you sell out on change as you go up the ladder. But for instance, to get into a nine to five job, you have to sell out on being able to wake up whenever you want, right? Yep. And people hate that, but that's just how it works, bro. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Well said. Yeah, well, and I hope, I think the one thing that I maybe am, I don't want to say I disagree with Grossman on, but I'm a little hesitant to say is that there is a, I I think, you know, his title is very provocative, The Peace and the Feud, and it's good academic writing, you got to have a zazzy title, I get it. I think he, you know, I would say maybe the the equilibrium is what you can find in the feud, and Mm. perhaps, I don't know, the realist side of me hopes that you could find some sort of peace in the sort of the competing and decentralized you know lat uh, like like um distribution of 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 relationships and allegiances but i don't know maybe all maybe the best you could find is just equilibrium and right now in this current era with this current thing whatever the current i can't even keep track whatever current thing it is now uh, there's no equilibrium perhaps some equilibrium with more decentralized feuding would be possible i don't know I try to remain hopeful. Um, I do think we're seeing the disintegration of maybe not this, the country, but something that used to exist, whatever that something yeah. was. 
And it will be, I hope we find a little bit more peace or if not peace equilibrium, <laughs> I guess that's sort of my concluding thoughts. Like it would be nice to have a give and a take and not so much of a, just a take. Um, I, I think I think that a, a great way that I mentally, you know, it, that, that I break up peace, the levels of peace into it is, is it heaven? Right, which I metaphysical things I'd love to talk to you about. Right, I, I think that heaven is impossible, philosophically speaking, and I think it'd be interesting to discuss that with you. But is it heaven? Just, just as a as a thought thing, is it Mises's evenly rotating economy? Right, because the evenly rotated economy is kind of what the progressives imagine as their ideal perfect world. Right, where people shuffle around and do things, but they all somehow know exactly what needs need to be fulfilled, and so they're in this loop where essentially nothing significant changes. And uh, anyway, read up on Mises' evenly rotating economy. That is oftentimes the 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 the, the thing that people say is their perfect utopia at the end of the day. And then you realize, wait a minute, that's only possible if the reality doesn't change at all anywhere around this system. And that's where you're like, okay, we need something different. And so I think something along the lines of a metastable equilibria, which look that up if you're unfamiliar with that, a metastable yeah, equilibria yeah. Is, is, is what we, is the best we can practically hope for. And anything beyond, trying to do anything beyond that will lead us to a disequilibrium that will eventually fail. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. I try to be realistically hopeful uh, and hopefully realistic. There's my chiasmus there. Um, that's what I try to hope for. Yeah. All right. Well, Elliot, thanks for coming on again. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to, uh, I'd like to give people who come on a little few, the, the floor at the end. Is there anything we should know? Like, would you like people to follow you certain places? Are you working on certain intellectual and or any other kind of uh, projects that you'd like people to tell or you'd like to tell people about anything like that? I am, but uh, I'm currently not in a position where anybody could reasonably look at it in, in any sort of reasonable way. I am sort of in the process of building. Um, so the next cool thing that I'm building is this map of postmodernism, and it's way less crazy than people think. The problem was, is it was written by poets, right? So a lot of the postmodern, like actual philosophical uh, things that they notice are just like, yeah, duh, right? Especially as we look around at us as digital natives, like actually what a lot of the postmodernists are saying is totally obvious to a digital native. The problem is, is that a lot of them were post-Marxists right, who were disillusioned by the Soviet Union and were desperately looking for something to replace that void. And so the solutions, and Thad Russell actually points this out, that yeah, their solutions are stupid and crazy, but what they're saying on average is actually not that stupid and crazy. And if you're interested in accelerationists like, like Nick Land or like the CCRU, right, um, then you really got to understand postmodern thought in order to understand any of the things those crazy motherfuckers are saying. So that's what I dived in. And I was like, oh, duh, if they weren't so pretentious, people could understand. And so I'm busy writing up a thing that totally explains what the fuck a meta narrative is. Right. So anyway, that's that's yeah. kind of that's kind of what I'm working on right now so that I can cool. get back to the cool accelerationist philosophy that I've been studying. So there you go. Cool. Well, neat. Well, we 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 do not put any pressure on you. Uh, good thought and good productivity needs to be um, unencumbered by artificial time constraints. But we 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 at least I eagerly await this. Uh, what will likely be a masterpiece of of, of a master analysis of postmodernism. So awesome. Yeah. You can, yeah. And uh, oh, everyone can you can follow me on uh, Twitter at at uh, at altphilologa. I know it's German, but that's fine. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I'll link to um, as many things as I can find that we talked about today. Um, like, comment, subscribe, all the good things. Um, I'll be putting out most likely another um, episode um, this coming week um, with my good friend Mitch. And we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be defending the notion of complexity in linguistics. So we will do another linguistic, uh, super hyper nerdy in a completely different vein type of uh, episode. Um, and then there's more to come too. I'm going to try to have Marshall back on. We'll do some more Yarvin and yeah, the, the good stuff keeps coming. Anyhow, uh, thanks to everyone and, uh, yeah, see you again shortly. Have a good one.